This is a band I've had quite a few people request and I'm so glad I'm finally covering them on my channel. Ugly Kid Joe would be characterized by the media as a relic of the hair metal era while others refer to them as a comic hard partying metal band. But in reality, the group's individual members came from diverse musical backgrounds, influenced by the likes of Black Sabbath, Molly Crew, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Motorhead, and many others. They also weren't afraid to mix humor with their music and they quickly became overnight rock stars and made history. But whatever happened to Ugly Kid Joe? Stay tuned to find out. Ugly Kid Joe began with guitarist Klaus Eichstadt and frontman Whitfield Crane, who grew up in Palo Alto, California, and formed a band in the late 80s. Initially called Overdrive, before settling on Ugly Kid Joe, the band's name was a goof on the glam rocker's pretty boy Floyd, for whom the band was supposed to open at one point in time. Ugly Kid Joe would play gigs around the Santa Barbara area and gave their demo to a local DJ named Will Carlin, who then passed it on to an entertainment lawyer who became the band's manager and got them a deal with Mercury Records. Shortly after signing to Mercury in early 1991, the pair realized that they needed to round out their lineup with better musicians. During the band's career, their lineup core has always centered around Eichstadt and Crane with a revolving cast of characters coming and going. Their debut release, an EP titled As Ugly As They Wanna Be, was a spoof of the hugely controversial Two Live Crew album, As Nasty As They Wanna Be. It took a week to record and cost the label around $12,000 to make. Mercury Records was hoping for the EP to sell maybe 15,000 copies, and it soon enough became the first debut EP in history to go multi-platinum, thanks in large part to the single Everything About You, which rocked MTV and radio airwaves. The album rocketed to number 4 on the Billboard charts and peaked at number 3 across the pond in Britain. The band also licensed the song to the first Wayne's World movie. According to Billboard magazine, there was a special way that the label promoted the EP. When the band first got signed to Mercury Records, the label helped get the album into small mom and pop shops where traditionally bigger labels hadn't sold albums to. According to Bob Scoro, who was the head of A&R at Mercury Records, who would tell Billboard magazine, None of the major distributors sell to mom and pop shops. That's where the young rock and metal lovers go. That's where the buzz starts. In addition to that, it would be a station in Denver, KBPI, who moved the single Everything About You from their metal show to regular programming. Within a few weeks, Ugly Kid Joe became the second highest requested band after Metallica. And soon enough, the band played Denver and local retailers could feel the excitement behind the group and MTV followed soon after. The EP took on a humorous tone with tracks like Madman describing an axe-wielding man on the loose in Disneyland. The band at one point was supposed to write music for the 1992 film Encino Man, but once Don Eisner at Disney heard the song, he axed the deal. But critics weren't always fans of Ugly Kid Joe. The Chicago Tribune stated the following about the EP single Everything About You. The single, which has a novelty kind of appeal, pretty much sums up the entire 25-minute disc which is a cacophony of funk, rap, lame choruses, and old jokes. Despite critics not being fans of theirs, the band did get some high-profile touring slots opening for the likes of Ozzy Osbourne and Def Leppard. And the band would soon follow up their EP with their first full-length studio record, 1992's America's Least Wanted. The album featured a surprising cover of Harry Chapman's Cats in the Cradle, which was a huge hit on rock radio, and became the band's second top 10 hit. The single Everything About You, which was released on their first EP in addition to the song Mad Men, would also appear on the LP. Despite the fact that the album was the band's most commercially successful of their career going double platinum, it again received mostly mixed reviews from critics, with the LA Times giving it 1.5 out of 4 stars, claiming generic MTV rad party dudes in baggies and tees who seem to know how certain kinds of rock are supposed to sound but I have no clue as to why it would read. Prior to the band recording their 1995 album Menace to Sobriety, they enlisted new drummer Shannon Larkin. Menace to Sobriety was once again a spoof of the movie Menace to Society. The album performed poorly due to changing musical tastes and a lack of support from the record label, in addition to long tours and substance abuse problems. The band did land some high profile touring spots opening for both Van Halen and Bon Jovi. Ugly Kid Joe would leave Mercury Records following the release of Menace to Sobriety and signed with an indie label, feeling that they weren't being properly supported with Whitfield Crane telling Louder Sound, 
I could sense that the label wasn't backing us on Menace to Sobriety, and they would have let us make another record and we could have done that, but it just didn't feel right. I pulled my manager to the side and I told him I wanted off the label. He told me he didn't think it was a good move, but I wanted off the label because I believed we could find another one and be who we are, so we walked away. Once the band signed to an indie label, they would release the album Motel California, a spoof of the Eagles, Hotel California, that didn't even chart in the States. By 1997, the band was done, with Crane telling Louder Sound why the band fell apart, saying, I think it was an amalgamation of many things. I think we were all sick of each other. I was sick of them, they were sick of me. You have to ask each guy. They had decided they didn't want to be in the band anymore, and I was like, wow, okay. And that was it. Nothing ends well, really. I can't really think of any marriages or relationships that end well. But I suppose the band ended at the best time that it could. We weren't mad at each other, and nothing evil or horrible happened. We just ended it. But it was still really sad, you know, he'd say. In 2010, the band would reform, and they would release an EP in 2012 called Stairway to Hell, and open for Guns N' Roses and Alice Cooper the same year. Their most recent release happened in 2015 with Uglier Than They Used To Be and as late as 2019 they were still touring as a band. That does it for today's video guys, thanks for watching, be sure to like button and subscribe, we'll see you again on Rock and Roll True Stories, take care.